Welcome to the Strong for Life podcast. I'm your host, Connor O'Shea, and I really appreciate you tuning in. If you are enjoying these episodes, I'd really appreciate you taking a moment and rating it five stars on Spotify or on Apple or whatever podcast platform you use. This is going to allow more people to find this information. Welcome to the Strong for Life podcast. I'm your host, Connor O'Shea, and today I'm joined by Dean Cochell. He's a nine-year digital nomad, world traveler, and also known as king of the digital nomad. So, Dean, welcome to the show, mate. Hello, my friend. Thank you for having me in your living room, bedroom. What is it? <laughs> it's an Airbnb living room. <laughs> nice. Where, where are you at? <laughs> so, in, in Sofia, and uh, myself and Dean, we, we crossed paths about two maybe a month ago now in Bansko very briefly we met at a cafe we were both speaking at Bansko Nomad Fest and I was really intrigued by his talk which was about how to become financially free or financially independent as a as a nomad right that's right so let's just start mate I mean that's a super interesting topic um, especially now with all the talk about inflation money all these things so let's maybe just start with a bit about like how you got on this path talk about you know where you grew up when did you start thinking about money about finances and how you've actually created this lifestyle for yourself yeah sure and i'll just um make a side note here that all this talk about inflation and uh what happens with the economy barely touched me and that's one of the very good um uh, pros and side bonus of being financially independent like yes of course i care if there's a crazy inflation but um it creates this security and safety net that almost no matter what external factors are happening in the world and changing i have this feeling of security so to talk about my financial journey um i'm coming from very middle class you know family and had like pretty normal jobs throughout my my career I'm, I'm 40 years old now I grew up in Israel uh, around Tel Aviv in some satellite cities um pretty decent life and a lot of fun play basketball a bunch of um was hanging friends but I think I started to kind of think about money and how I manage it pretty early on and you know if it's if I got some uh, pocket money for my parents I would save it instead of uh buying some random uh, games or cards like a player cards or something like that uh, i started investing in the stock market and losing money very early and, like i think at 16 was the first time i lost money on the stock market which was fun um i actually had a blog uh, 20 plus years ago it's called the money monkey uh <laughs> as uh it was follow the monkey so coming from really normal family it's only that my parents were pretty terrible at managing their money <laughs> and not, not terrible but you know there's like life and mortgage and a lot of the conversation and if there were arguments it was like over the mortgage and we need to pay this and we need to, to do that and we don't have enough and money was kind of a, a, a topic and an issue and it, I think it created a trauma for me so for example I always told myself I will never buy a house with a mortgage because I kept hearing the mortgage, the mortgage, the mortgage for like 20 years, right? So <laughs> I'm actually building a house now with all the money up front with no mortgage. Not that I actually think it's the smartest thing to do because mortgage is a great vehicle. Um, it's just the case. And from this trauma, I was like, okay, I want to set myself free. I want to be feel this security, have this safety net. It's not about becoming the richest person on earth. It's not about having all the money in the world it's about being comfortable and it's about having the freedom to say not about it's not saying yes to things because i'm big on saying yes and i love to say yes to every adventure and to try anything twice but it's about the opportunity to say no when the job offer come and yeah the money is good but the job is not interesting it's not exactly what i want to do right now and that's kind of freedom that i'm experiencing now I'm really doing what i feel like playing through my own music and kind of composing my own melody. And, and, and that's a fantastic feeling that although I've been traveling for nine years now, I've been to more than 100 countries in the process. I worked remote for the last 10 years. We can talk about my career a little bit. Uh, we can touch that. Um, so 
I, I, all the time I thought I'm free, but I had a remote job and I was, you know, tied to my calendar and to phone calls and the clients. And I had a lot of responsibilities and I still do, but now I get to choose. Um, I'll say that the good news about my financial journey from zero to hero, from zero to where I'm at now, uh, it took me about eight years. I started my financial journey at age 32. So it's really never late to say, all right, I need to make a change to turn around the financial situation. I started with very little uh, and I grew it to, to a low seven figures number that allowed me to generate passive income. Um, do you want to jump in or do you want me to like, I can give long answers to a very short question. So <laughs> no, this is how long you want me to. This is really interesting. Yeah. Because like I'm 34 now, really, I probably didn't start thinking about money until I was 30. Really. I was traveling. I was in Asia up until I was like 27, 28. Then I relocated to Melbourne, Australia. And I kind of started, I got, back into kind of the real world we'll say you know working I started my own business um so I'm 34 now and and really yeah the last kind of two years in particular which is kind of like 32 I've been like okay I want to actually get my finances sorted so before we kind of jump into more like first steps for someone like myself like what where you would start putting money and and, and savings or investments Maybe like you spent time in California uh, when you were a bit younger as well, right? Were you working uh, in a job role there or how did all that happen? So I was, I grew up in Israel and I spent half my life in Israel. Then at age 21, I moved to New York for a job opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, not a job that made a lot of money. And I was always uh, with a, a mind and money mindset. But the money mindset that was I had in New York was about spending my money, you know, buying buying the shiny objects, buying the nice sunglasses and the newest phone and uh, all the clothes, uh, the nice clothes on Fifth Avenue. I was dressed really, really nice, but I had a very boring story. And now I kind of dress like a bum, but I have <laughs> a, a more interesting story. And it's a very interesting shift for myself also, how people perceive us and what game we play. Um within society when it comes to visibility and what, what how much we care about what other people think of us and what price we pay for this like what are we um kind of giving away our freedom for for yeah i have the, the latest watch or the nicest car in the hood uh so i moved to new york and then came back to israel and a few years later i moved again to san francisco for a job uh, my career, most of my, my career, 20 years, I was in tech. I worked a little bit of code. I did some system administration back when it was still a profession, um, servers. And eventually I moved into the service side. I was doing some customer success. But basically, it's, um, it's a role where you manage the business relation with customers, integration of software, project management kind of a job. Really liked it. Uh, I love people. It's probably the biggest motivation for me for the world travel to meet people from, from different cultures and backgrounds. So this job served it well because I really was working with a lot of people. And it was a normal paying job. It was a, a good, it's, it's a tech industry. So the salaries are generally good but uh, and, and it definitely helped me. But this is not the story. And that's not what made actually the big jumps because again, I was making maybe uh, you know, three, $4,000 a month, but I was living in a very expensive city like San Francisco, or I was spending it on bullshit. So I moved to San Francisco and luckily my visa to like my work permit to the States was delayed. It's just a lot of paperwork. So instead of taking two weeks, it took six months. And during this time, I couldn't stay in the States. So my company told me, okay, go work remote. And we are talking 2014. And I go work remote. It's new to me. Uh, I do like to travel because my mom is a tour guide leader. So I've been traveling since a young age. And slowly I'm like, oh, this is nice. You know, like I can be in Portugal and open my laptop or in Taipei and open my laptop or in Japan, uh, in Bali, in Thailand, etc." So I do that for a few months. And I start to see that more people are copying me. Q1 
kidding. Like I see more people in the coffee shop and like left. I was like, what do you do? Oh, I'm a digital nomad. Um, so like I started to learn about the term and Google it and start to be exposed to podcasts. Uh, a lot of what I know in my life, what I've done in the last 10 years is thanks to podcasts, by the way. Like a lot mm. of podcasts I listen to. And to today, uh, we could talk about it because I I listen to podcasts when I shower. Um, I when I when I drive on the scooter, where every dead minute that I have, I'm like I would listen to podcasts, and it's been amazing for me. Um, I can recommend few as well. Yeah, definitely. We'll so get that at the end. When the visa finally arrived and I could work, move back to the states, I kind of co- told my company like, forget it, guys. Like I'm not going back to the nine to five. I've been to like 15 countries in the last last six months, having the time of my life. And they told me something that I'll never forget. You earned it. You proved that you, the work can be performed um, very well, regardless of your location. Clients are happy. We are happy. Team is happy. Go on. Live your life. Um, and um, thankful for, for the people who had the vision and had the, the, the courage to, to do something like that. And I've been remote since. And again, as I said, like 100 plus countries now, I think 103 that I've been to, and I do have kind of a mission to visit all 196. I changed a few jobs with the customer success, but I stayed um, within the same uh, profession all these years until actually five months ago where I officially retired from tech and announced my financial independence. Mm, gotcha. and I would say something about financial independence and financial freedom. These two terms often um, brought up at the same time and what it actually means. So financial freedom is kind of a a step up from financial independence. Financial freedom means that we have $20 million in the bank. We don't care about inflation. Today, we like to be in Bali, but tomorrow we decide we want to live in New York in a lavish uh, apartment and a nice uh, expensive uh, car. We can afford it. It's like basically you never run out of money. Financial independence, It's the little sister. It's a little bit more modest. It's I have enough money for the rest of my life based on a certain lifestyle. Okay, if I need to sustain myself, let's say $3,000 a month, okay, for the lifestyle I I wish to have, I multiply this number by 300. And that's the number that one need to save in order to achieve their financial independence. Okay, so it's in this case, 3,000 by 300 is $900,000. Sorry, mate. Repeat that. You you jumped out uh, with the connection. What? Why is it multiplied by three hundred? So three hundred is basically twenty five years. That's what it stands for. It's three hundred months. Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay, cool. And that having a, then we have an assumption that your investment portfolio will um, produce at least four percent interest a year. Okay, if it's more, it's great. Um, and why 4%? It's been proven over the history, at least. It's based on historical data. So it definitely doesn't say anything about um, you know, looking forward and forward looking years, but generally the assumption that you can make 4% a year, and in the last 10 years it's actually been eight or nine percent. So people actually grew their wealth while being financially independent. And that will generate you the $36,000 a year, which are $3,000 a month, okay? Proportionally, pretty much for the rest of your life. Okay, awesome. So the the, the basic calculation that any listener want to do is like, okay, how much money I need? What are my expenses right now? Multiple, Mm -hmm. to to live the comfortable life I want, not just uh, need like the basics. you can think also, don't, you know, if you are 20, 30, 40, you also want to look forward to like 60 and 70, what your life might look like. Where do you ultimately want to find yourself living? Will you have family or not? Because if uh, you're financially independent at 35, and then at age 50, your entire life changes, you don't want to go back now to, to the workforce because if you haven't practiced anything kind of out of, out of shape in terms of uh, professional career. So, but this is financial independence. This is really the basic formula. Take this 3,000, 1,000, 500,000 um, and multiply them by 300. And that should be your FI number. FI stands for financial independence, FI. Right now there is lean FI, 
there is FATFA. FATFA is retiring with $10,000 a month, a month. And LINFI is, I know a lot of people that have $1,500 a month from different investments. They go live in Thailand, in Bulgaria, in Hungary, in other uh, cheap countries where you have amazing quality of life. And it's amazing. And when you can do it in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, that's that's incredible. Um, right? So that that's the, the very essence of uh, of it. Now, a lot of people who like follow me on social media or just know me in real life, um, they see how busy I am. I'm incredibly, incredibly busy with my schedule, the things I do. Uh, I do a million things a day. I sleep less than four hours a night, I think. I don't know if it's something that you will promote here, but... Um, <laughs> I and say, okay, so what's what exactly this financial retirement? What is this independence if you're so busy? So financial retirement and doesn't mean that I don't do anything. At age 40, I'm not gonna sit at home and do nothing. And as I said, it allows me to now I'm building a house in Bali, my dream, my dream villa. I'm working on a new community that I want to to promote. I'm helping countries to attract digital nomads and I'm helping uh, minorities and developing countries to help their uh, citizens to have access to better opportunities through remote jobs. So I'm doing a lot of things, but thanks to this financial independence setup, I'm able to do things that before uh, I could not. Right? I just didn't have the freedom or the mindset to to allow this. Yeah, mate. That's you've shared so many things here. I wanna before we go into kind of the specific work you're doing now, because that's super interesting. Um, let's kind of just go to getting started again. This is a, a selfish question, but like if you're kind of, um, in your thirties, you want to start, you know, thinking about this kind of, you know, monthly number times 300 and you want to start putting money aside to set yourself up, like what would be the initial steps? So are you putting that into like the stock market? What, where are you making like a you know, uh, whatever, like a savings account for three months expenses. And then once that's done, then you start like allocating money into like a stock market or something like that. So what are the initial steps? Right. So there are three pillars, uh, the way I see it, to achieve financial independence. The first one and the easiest one is save money, spend less, Mm -hmm. right? The second will be make more money. And the third will be invest. So the first stage, really spend less money is easy, but it's limited because we all need a shelter, we need health, we need uh, insurance or something, we need food. So see where you can cut on the fat. Like, do you need those uh, mobile phone package that you have with the 40 gigs, do you use it? Maybe it's only five euros, but it's five euros, right? Um, Do you really need to upgrade your phone right now? All the things, do you eat out and spend three, 400 euros a month on it or even more or less? Can you save this for now? And it's very annoying, especially when you're at 20s, 30s, to, to give up on this like life quality and small things that makes it interesting and fun and spice up our life. But I see it as a short-term pain for the long-term gain. It's very simple. I slept in hostels for six, seven years now. And like 300 nights a year, I stayed in a room with other five other strangers and paying $8 a night on average instead of $50 a night on average on Airbnb or whatever it is, right? So when you multiply it, instead of spending 600 to 1,000 euros a month on accommodation, for seven years, I spent about $300 a month on accommodation. My housing expenses were average at $3,000 a year. Wow. Over time, I had friends and I stayed with friends around the world. But, you know, it's that what it was. So think about how much money I could save and this extra money instead of going and buying a new phone, I put in the bank. So cut on expenses. And I, I, love, I, I love the example of the hostel because typically accommodation is one of the two largest expenses we have. And you look where I'm ending up now, I'm building my dream house at age 40 in Bali. So, and that's all thanks to, to giving up a little bit on accommodation for a few years. And not only that, you know, it sounds like um, I gave up something and I probably did, but also gained a lot of friends, 
a lot of memories, amazing stories, amazing friends that stay with me for life and just good times. Like hostels are the ultimate place to meet other backpackers, travelers, nomads. Um, so I didn't even feel it's a sacrifice. I'm, I'm excited to go to a hostel. Tell me today to stay in a hostel, I would love to. Mm-hmm. And that was true when I made $1,500 a month. And it was true when I was making $10,000 a month. I made t- I had crazy month, somehow made money on the stock market, maybe crypto, you name it. And I said, oh, maybe this month I go, I'll stay at the Hilton for $200 a night. No, $8 hostel. Oh, wow. $10,000, I'll keep in my pocket. And again, I give up now. Now this money generates, I can buy all the phones I want and I can stay in all the Hiltons I want and I can travel whenever I need. So it's this is a mindset work to understand that, yes, I'm giving up something now to only see the result in the future. It's almost like a, a, a diet or an exercise. You know, you don't uh, do a, a push-up, so I, oh, I have a six-pack. No, you need to do it for years <laughs> until you see the results. You need to give up million chocolate bars and ice creams to, to see the result. So that's it's a, it's a mindset more than it's a muscle. And when you start this muscle and you train it, it's become easy and easy. It's easier to to walk on the street, see a nice an, an object, nice object, a shiny object, and say, I don't need it. Yeah. Buying it now doesn't serve my goals to where I want to go in the future. And that goes hand in hand with minimalism. And if you would ask me how to achieve financial independence or how to become digital nomad and travel the world, I will tell you minimalism in both options. So uh, it's the biggest change I made in my life. Again, I lived in Tel Aviv. I lived in New York and San Francisco, like some of the ultimate uh, symbols of capitalism, right? And, and, and consume uh, this consuming um, society. Uh, it was fun. But it, again, it didn't help me to build wealth. And I was buying, buying, and buying. And at some point in around 2012, 13, I moved five, six apartments within a year. And every time I packed, I had like 10 boxes. So I threw away two boxes. I don't need so many glasses. I don't need all these clothes. And a month later, I had to move and I packed up. And every day I had 10 boxes again. And the same thing, I, threw, I would throw out two. And then the next two, after two months, I would constantly buying, you know, go to Ikea. Can you go through the maze and not buy six glasses, nice picture frame, you know, like some hangers for your clothes? <laughs> Which is, hey, it's so cheap. Why not? It's, it's on discount. It's promotion. So I stopped doing that. And I realized that all these sofas and sound systems and TVs and just holding me down, they're not freedom. Than the opposite. All of a sudden, I need to service the TV. I need to take it for service. I need to clean the sofa. I need to fold the chairs. I've been start. I, I was working for my object. Yeah, you know, I need to park my car. I need to change. Hmm. What? I bought a car. Now I'm working for it. I'm driving it to the garage to be fixed. Like no, sir. Like this car support support to supposed to work for me. So it's not. It's, these are not assets. These are liabilities, right? Hmm. You, you hmm. buy a, a new iPhone for $1,400 and now you put another case on it so you don't even enjoy like what it looks like and 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 it, it just all the, you care just not to break it and protect it so it's like <laughs> yeah man I love the, uh, right? what, what you're saying there like it's the I think it's the fight club phrase saying the things you own end up owning you which yes, is basically yes. what you're and then saying the, another another beautiful saying I think from the same movie is we buy uh things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't care for yeah and that's what we do you know mm-hmm. like the people who care for you who care who you are don't care what you wear they care what you stand for they care about mm. your mindset about how you show up as a friend as a family not about oh you don't have a, a chanel shirt or a handbag so you know if, the, if this is your friends judge you by this I think something is wrong. <laughs> totally, mate. <laughs> you babe. want to check, check, it, check it with yourself, not with your friends. Um, it's interesting as well, because like the, what you've said there, they're kind of, it's like the basic teachings of Buddhism as well. It's like basically what Buddhism says is everything is about cravings and aversions. So we crave stuff that we want and we're unhappy because we don't have that thing. So you're like, oh, I wish I had the car, the job, 
the wife, the husband, I'm not going to be happy until I get it. And then when you get it, then you are, you're, uh, you're struggling with aversion. So you're trying to avoid losing the thing. So I have the car, oh, I don't want my car to get robbed. I don't want to lose my phone. I don't want to lose my partner. So like you're in this constant mix of like being unhappy because you don't have the thing and being unhappy because you're worried about losing the thing. So I love that you've literally touched on this stuff that is the kind of the human condition. So let's it's, uh, it's keep going. Mate, wow, yeah. So much like that. Yeah, I, I'll just say I, I want to expand a little bit more on the minimalism because it's mm. such a key element, uh, not just for financial freedom, but everything else I think in life. And I think I, I really want to and hope that as many listeners will give it a, a chance and a shot and play with this idea. Because minimalism, when people hear it, they think, oh, I like I need to sleep in hostels and wear the same t-shirt five days a week and never shower. No. If you, if you like speedy, speed, fast cars and fancy jewelry, you can buy them all. If you can afford them, buy all the Ferraris in the world. No problem. That you are still minimalist as long as this is what you want and desire and gives you pure joy, right? Minimalism is about buying those things that you really want, not because the marketing department of some, of some brand wrote on a magazine, Connor, um, you should buy this um, jacket for winter. This is the nicest, like this is the right jacket for this winter. And next winter, they'll put the same but with a different jacket and they'll make you buy a new one. And on in the process, they'll tell you, well, while you wear a jacket, make sure that everyone see the logo so you can promote us. So more of your friends will buy this jacket. So we'll have more money. And basically what all these brands are telling us through these ads is, hey, can you go find a job, spend 48 days, 48 hours every uh, week in the office and then take the money and come to our shop and give us your money? And we'll give you something in return. Here's headphones. You know, like <laughs> this is what the system does. Like Michael Kors. Hey guys, uh, please go work this month because I need money. And they will give you some fabric, some cotton that I'm getting from China for, for $1.50. This, for me, it's insane. When I understood this, that changed everything <laughs> for, mm. for this mindset. Because I thought, oh, I'm free. No one is controlling me. I'm a freelancer. I'm a entrepreneur. I was controlled by these brands so telling me, Start the business so you can make money, so you can give your, us your money. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is minimalism, overcoming the marketing cycle, overcoming that they tell me what I need to, how I need to dress and how I need to, to show up. Like, as I said earlier, I was New York, the nicest shoes, <laughs> button down, shirt, jacket. You will talk to me in a bar, I have no interesting story to tell you. I go around Bali here, I'm in flip flops, this shirt that I, I haven't bothered to, to iron. And everyone wants to talk and you have amazing friends and the most beautiful sunset and just happiness. So, mm, and it's so much it, better. Love it, mate. Yeah. And I, I'm glad that you touched on that point as well, because like for you, you know, accommodation was something that you were happy to save money on, but for someone else, maybe accommodation is something that they value and they'll be more minimalistic in other parts to save money. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Like it needs to work for the individual, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It could be, you know, keep those convenient and see what works better for you. Like today I enjoy eating out in a really nice places, but I still give up on the fancy clothes. It's has no interest in, in brand clothing, for example. So once you take on minimalism and the beauty of it is that it's addicting. Like the, you start to get rid of one shirt and another shirt. It's like all of a sudden, like, it's like, it's a waterfall. It's like, oh my God, I just, I don't want anything. Like just getting uh, getting rid of everything. And it freed me, not just from all this weight and waste that I was carrying from one apartment to another in suitcases and boxes, but it freed my mind. I was mm-hmm. edgy and I was like, you know, easy to move from place. You want to go to Australia? Okay, give me five minutes. That's all I need to put all my clothes into a carry-on. And I'm living off a single carry-on and a day pack with, for my laptop. That's all I have for nine years. It's all my belongings. Wow. Everything I own is in, it can, can fit into a single carry-on, right? So the, How, how heavy is that, Dean? How, how many it's kilos? About 11, 12 kilograms. All right. I, I want to, like, so... Basically, like, what do you what do you have? What clothes do you have? I have clothes for about fourteen days, 
I have flip flops, two pair of shoes, one like sport shoes, okay. one like day shoes. I have uh, probably five, six, seven t shirts, couple button down shirts, uh, some shirts for like training, um, shorts, like three, four of them, and one pair of jeans. I remember when I started to uh, play minimalism, I went to one of those Facebook groups and I asked guys, like, how do you travel? with two pair of jeans i have four and i don't know how to to and oh everyone like told me are you crazy who travels with two pair of jeans we have one we wash it in the shower we try it and we wear it the next day so <laughs> so i travel with one pair of jeans right now i don't shower with it but um yeah i it's... do you stay in in mostly warm climates like obviously if you're in a yes, warm yes. Uh, a colder climate you'll probably need a little bit more exactly yeah yeah gotcha okay uh, i don't have it here but i have i have a lighter a light jacket for rain but it's really light uh, and you can easily roll it into like um something the size of, of your hand, your um yeah your hand and i instead of having thick layers like coats i have thermal shirts which are very thin very light fit easily in the suitcase but generally speaking i my system is very simple if i don't use it once a week it doesn't go into my suitcase mm. if i'm not if right if it doesn't serve any function or service me once a week it's not going with me and in most cases uh or those items i can get anywhere and for much much cheaper and if I would have carried more stuff with me, I want my shampoo and my uh, hair dryer, and I don't know what. Now I need to check in my suitcase. It's at least $40, $50 every flight. I take 30, or actually I take 40 to 50 flights a year, multiplied by the time, but the money I, I need to pay. Let's say you take 20 flights a year. That's almost $1,000 a year. For $1,000, I can replace my entire wardrobe. I can buy another 50 shirts wherever I want, and pants and I know whatever I need, right? So I rather not care, pay for it all the time and pay, pay for it when I need it. It's mm. like on demand. And uh, we, we we often leave our the comfort of our first world countries, the UK, Germany, the States, Israel, Japan. And we think like, oh, we need to buy, to bring everything with us because there are no toothpaste in Thailand. Don't worry guys, there is toothpaste in Thailand. You know, you bring your special shampoo from uh, the edge of earth. But yeah, I don't I don't carry all these things. Everything is available anywhere in the world. Um, so keep it very uh, minimalistic. And if I'm missing something, I go and, and buy it. It's, it's really super easy. Never been a problem. So minimalism. And that's really wrap up, I think, the first part of like spend less, keep tight around your expenses, um, budget, right? Monitor your... You're spending, see how much you spend on every uh, item or category. Think about what's important for you. Um, if if an extra fifty dollars for going out with friends is 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 it's making a change, spend another fifty dollars. It's fine, right? Like, don't be miserable in the process. You need to be happy and and, and enjoy the process as well. Otherwise, it won't be sustainable. Yeah. Right? Uh, so this is the first part. The second part is the making money, right? Have the career and have a job. And the beauty that in our, in our times, you can be anything pretty easily. Like if you want to be a photographer, in the past, you had to go to New York to study in the School of Photography in New York and get a diploma. And now you can do weddings. Nowadays, you buy a camera, you put a website, you, said, um, you say, I'm a photographer, and this is it. You're a, photo you're a photographer. If you want to be a content writer or a blogger, you can write one blog article on your trip to Mexico, and this is it. You're a travel blogger. No one can take this from you. You know, I'm a supermodel. I'm a singer, and I'm a cook. I'm a terrible cook. You might think I'm a terrible cook. You won't like my food. You think I'm not a model, and you think I, how I, I sing, but it I doesn't you make me less... <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make me okay i agree <laughs> I, it doesn't make me less of a singer of a model what other things you understand and that's the beauty of of our times anyone can start another gig on fiverr or upwork and we have multi-talents a lot of us have a, a hobby and this hobby can you know can turn into a, a second income or even career 
there are many people that in fitness, you, you're not, you don't grow up thinking that you'll become a personal trainer, but you go to the gym, you fall in love with the routine, with the results, with how it makes you feel. Then, oh, you know what? I'm good at it. I'll become, I'll, I'll, I'll guide people through this. So, and you learn, you study, of course, you, you get better at what you do. But um, again, it's, it's so easy. If you want to start a, a, an e-commerce shop nowadays, you don't need thousands of dollars. It's, it's, it's really a, a very low entry ticket and it allows people to make million mistakes throughout the journey. I'm a big fan of failing and failing fast and failing as often as possible because what a failure is you trying, is us trying something, seeing if it works or not, and move to the next thing and until something catches. I failed way more times than I probably succeeded in business and and life and you know if you look at my financial journey it's not just a, a sharp line going up and all of a sudden growing the money I, I, I lose money uh, when i invest when i trade everything i do so uh I, i'll suggest people i would say first if you already have a job if you feel you're undervalued and underpaid don't be afraid to ask for more know your value value yourself not what know what you bring to the business and make the case for asking for a raise, for example. And it needs to be a good case, you know, about value, about it's not, hey, I'm trying to become financial independence and work from Thailand. It's not the, the best argument. Um, but put yourself in the company seat and then the manager and the decision maker seat and understand what they appreciate and value most about your work. And if we highlight this and why we're valuable to the company, I want to believe that good managers, uh, they might refuse because big companies has different restrictions, but um, no one, I don't know anyone who lost their job because they asked for a raise. I actually mm. think when you ask for a raise, it shows the company that you value yourself more. It's okay if they tell you no, but you tried. Because if you don't try, you never know, mm -hmm. right? Like if I... Uh, uh, if you if you ask no is the default answer you already have the no so if we ask for a raise the only change possible is it will change for a yes that's why we need to ask and what it does when we ask for a raise or even when i negotiate a new contract i i say my number not a range i always give a very specific number this is my value this is exactly how i value myself and i might settle for less but they know in their mind, you know, they will tell you, yeah, you want 100, but we can give 80 right now. But now they know from now and forever that I want to be at 100. Mm. So when it's time to compensate and it's time for bonuses and it's time for a raise, they know, yes, we know Dean wants to be at 100. Mm -hmm. So we, you set the marker, even if you, you don't hit there the first time in a year or two, and, and they'll be there. Otherwise, they say, hey, you know what? Uh, here is a, a coupon for you for a nice dinner. No, I don't value dinner. I want, I value, I want more stock options. So I want a financial bonus, you know, a monetary bonus. So it set, it set the set the the, the tone and, and some watermark for them. Um, and then look around, see what you can do. Like there's so many opportunities to make extra money on the side, and this extra money. Uh, it makes big impact. I mentioned that we can save a few dollars on accommodation and a few dollars on food. And um, if you buy, I don't know, I'm just trying to think what I bought recently. Uh, I bought a phone case, you know, a case for my phone. And mm -hmm. there's the original one, it costs you $50. And there's a not original one, it costs you $5. So, okay, it's like $5. It's a phone case. Like, it doesn't need to be an original. Like if I buy mm. a USB cable, I don't need the twelve dollars cable. I'll buy the four dollars, because even if it breaks after five months, which is it will not, I will buy another one. And I still save money, and it's so difficult to say, "Wow, like this guy saving two dollars here, okay, and two dollars more, so he has four dollars now." A million dollar are made of million dollars, one and one and one, a lot of million single dollars, and this is why. We need to save every dollar, and that's what eventually will make it a million, mm -hmm. right? So keep this in, in mind and value every uh, gig that you can come. Go on Fiverr, 
you'll, you'll be amazed what kind of services people sell and how they make money. For example, um, where you're in Bansko now, it's like, I in will- Sophia. Like, I, in Sophia. I will um, hold a sign with your name uh, next to Sophia main train station and take a picture of it. I'll send you a picture with your name. And people make do this, you know, and they make money with it. I'm traveling to Eiffel Tower. I'll hold a sign with your name next to Eiffel Tower. It's people who cannot travel right now. They will pay for this. They need a, they want to buy a gift and name of their friend. I will talk with you over the phone for anything you want for 10 minutes, $20 for 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay? yeah. Amazing. Amazing. You go to Fiverr, it's like, I'm wasting my career on something very different. And I don't think I'm doing right. Last night, I was hosting a community meetup and I, Interviewed an 11 years old girl that had been nomading for 11 years since she was born. She speaks four languages. She is learning her fifth, and she's an online English teacher. At and she's traveling with her family, I'm guessing. With her yeah? family. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And so if, if someone tells me that they cannot find like an online job or make extra income, it's like, we're giving us also very many excuses because it's comfortable to be home and watch Netflix, I guess. But and also and see what- with that as well, mate, I think just for people listening, you know, as someone who runs my own business, the most attractive thing I look for, if I'm looking for help or looking to hire someone is what have they done? So even if you're like, oh, I've got my regular job, I want to make more money on the side, start publishing stuff about what you can actually help someone with. Because if I am looking for, I don't know, someone to help me with video editing or something like that, I don't necessarily want to go to a big corporation, but if I can see your blog or YouTube, you're doing awesome videos, even if it's a completely, you know, uh, you're, you're doing it as a hobby, you can then potentially get hired or at least you can send that as a portfolio to the business owner and it's a much more attractive thing just kind of waiting in the darkness for for someone to hire you out of the blue that's amazing yeah like make yourself known for what you want to sell it might take time but eventually people will know you for this i have people come to me it's like dean uh if you hear of the job let me know all right what am I supposed to do with this information? But if you if someone t- come to me and tell me, Dean, if you know of a job for digital marketing, that digital marketing marketing agency dealing specifically with Google Ads, because that's what I do and this is what I'm good at, the next time I'll be in some random conversation in the co-working space and someone say, Hey, you know someone who can help you with Google Ads? Yes, I know exactly the, the guy who can help you. And I, I will not think about, oh yes, I have this random guy who told me that he's willing to take on any job. So let me connect with you. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, and it, it, it's, you can be anything you want today. Seriously, like only lawyers and accountants and few other jobs still need kind of a license and they have some regulation around it. But for the most part, if you want to be an English teacher online, you don't need any license anymore. Like you can sell any service and any knowledge and your personal story is can be a business. I go around the world on stages giving talks with my story. I, there's no wrong or right. It's just, this is what I've been doing for nine years. You know, here I'm on the podcast talking, talking on, speaking on your podcast about my life story and my experience. I didn't invent financial independence. I didn't create minimalism or digital nomad lifestyle. I just talk about my life experience and that's, a, that's my business. I became like, that's what we see today as influencers. So every person can have a story. You work in a co- in McDonald's as a, uh, in the kitchen. I swear to God, if you go and start a series of talks, what it is like to work in fast food chains and what's the life of uh, working in the kitchen of McDonald's, I will come to your talk and I will buy a ticket for this. Like, and not just meet thousands of people. It's like, it's fascinating. Oh, wow, you know what? Like I eat at McDonald's so many times in my life. <laughs> Everything is a story. And that's, mm. that's really incredible. And People ask me, why am I being called the king of digital nomad? And it talks to the exact same point. It started as a joke. Some guy, some travel blogger started to call me this way. And then I, when I, I thought about it, it's like, wow, no one claimed to be the king of digital nomad. This position is out for claim. So as a social experiment, I just decided 
to write it on my Instagram, King of Digital Moment. And now I go on stages and all of a sudden they call me like this. And people see me, like meet me on the street, know me from Instagram. It's like, hi, King of Digital Moment. It's like, <laughs> if, you are, if you write on your Instagram right now that you are top 10 Formula One drivers in the world, I tell someone will recognize you for this eventually. <laughs> like, like it's 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 amazing that we have a lot of trust. This is why we have Airbnb. We stay in strangers' house or Uber. We drive with in strangers' car. So we trust. There's a lot of online information out there, and people are generally good. So be what you want to be. Plan for it. Work for it. Manifest this, um, and and pursue. And you can don't don't settle. Life is short, and make it fun. And when you when you have fun and you do what you love, money will follow and follow easily because people love to pay people who are passionate and excited about what they do. If you need a carpenter and you go to a carpenter that's like is just in love with wood and woodwork and artistic, like he will create the, the most beautiful closet you ever need, asking for in your life, right? So um, so same if you're passionate about what you do, uh, I don't think you can you can go wrong. And also about the failure you mentioned uh, when in, in, in the tech industry, when you try to raise money for your startup, you go to VC companies that give you funds and give you in the millions, right? Not here's a hundred quid for you. They, what they care for is the person you are and what, where have you failed before? If you never failed before, they will not talk to you. Mm. because it means you haven't experienced this it, you don't know what it likes to to deal with challenges and then uh, hitting the wall so failing is one of the best gifts one can give themselves so grow your money make money extra job uh, value yourself more if you are already a entrepreneur you know see how you can add extra value and you can charge more for it make sure that you are uh with with the market when it comes to prices and I'm not afraid to be the most expensive in the market for what I do. And if someone will want to work with me because my price is not right, that's fine. Then I mm -hmm. have my value. Mm -hmm. And that's how I value my knowledge and my time and experience. And I end up with the people who value me in the same way. So I don't lower my prices for others. And I also don't go to other people. And when they tell me, yes, it's $2,000 to build your website, I don't tell them, oh, you're very expensive. It's like, no, you, they might be made very expensive for me. But their mm. services, I'm sure, um, worth every every penny. I have a, a life coach paying him a thousand dollar a month, which it essentially, when well, at the beginning I thought it's nuts, and now it's like, okay, the, what I'm getting out of it is just life changing. Like take all my money, <laughs> like you know, it's like mm. you know, same same with a same with a personal trainer. I like like yeah, man. I don't need to pay you to tell me to run on a treadmill and lift. I know that myself. You yeah. know what? I've seen results that I haven't seen in 10 years in my body and my shape and, and how I feel. Thanks to like six, seven hundred dollars a month, and I pay this guy. Um, complete life changing. It's paying professionals is the biggest cheat in life. Like I, I would outlaw online courses because it's it's cheating, right? It's hey, let me buy knowledge that it took others 10 years to gain. So you just pay someone five hundred dollars for the online course, and now you're smart as they are. How is that fair? <laughs> repeat. Can you repeat that again, Michael? I think that's such an important point. That that's such a massive point that I think people need to hear. So yeah, go again. Yeah, it's a, it, I'll give another example. I was trying to change my residency to save on tax money. I would gather all the information I could online. And it's a very complex task because it depends where you're from, where, where you move to, what you do, what kind of income you have, million questions. And I said, I'm not paying $1,000 for a lawyer to fix me this. $1,000 an hour? This is insane. No, sorry. It took me two years to try and get her information, piece all the th things together, and still I didn't get the full answers. Eventually I paid $1,000 an hour. I actually paid $2,000 because I needed two hours. The guy in two hours, answer all my questions, all the things that I need to know, showed me where I made a mistake in one of the documents that saved me $25,000 in tax that I would otherwise have to pay, okay? Because this is what he does all his life. He dedicated his life to this one single form on how to do it. So uh, it's, it's a cheat. You're like, hey, I gave you money and you just unloaded all your information on me 
and now I'm just smart as you. And I don't even yeah. need to carry this information with me. It's just, I mean, it's investment. It's very difficult to look, oh, I'm giving this person my money. No, you're giving yourself a gift of knowledge and a shortcut in life. You can be 10 people. If you pay 10 other people, right? You're now 11 people altogether. So you multiply your force, your knowledge, everything. And I was cheap. I was trying to cut corners, save wherever I, wherever I can. Uh, it was part of the journey. Uh, but now, completely the opposite. Wherever I can pay someone to, not only to help me, but they know better. Like, why not go with the best? I'm average at 90% of the things I do in life. I'm very good with community. I'm good with investments. I'm good with other things. But not when it comes to changing my residency or life coaching or working out or I don't know what, like we're building a website. Look, go to my website. They look crap. You know why? Because I haven't paid someone professional to do that. <laughs> That's so good, man. Yeah, it's such a, it's a hard thing to get your head around as well. Like everyone I know who's like, you know, a high achiever, they invest in coaching or they invest in professionals who know more than them because as you said it's a hack like instead of spending hours and then getting worse outcomes you spend the price which it's again it's like your investment portfolio you're not really seeing the benefit until you know after you give the money um but yeah it's such an important thing to to um make clear and reinforce i think the the last kind of area I want to talk about a bit more in detail is around investing. Okay, so you you talked about saving money, making more money. Um, what would you say? You know, if you're in a place where you're, you know, you're kind of you're earning money, and now you're in a place where you have, um, you know, savings, and you want to start start investing, should like should we put it all into crypto, or what's the best thing to do? Uh, first, we put a big disclaimer here that I am not a licensed uh, advisor, financial advisor, and anything being said here is uh, really not uh, a professional advice. And I do, again, I uh, would argue that you uh, people to, to use professional services and pay for services with people who know exactly this is their profession. Financial independence is my hobby, uh, not my job. But... Uh, Personally, I don't touch crypto. I have zero crypto in my portfolio. I had a little bit crypto over the years as a speculation. I would buy for three, four, five days or two weeks uh, if I saw an opportunity and I was actively trading it. But I don't believe in this um, asset class for the sheer reason that I don't understand this asset class. I don't understand how it works. I don't understand the forces. I don't know who stands behind it. Um, and I typically try not to invest uh, in things that I read on Reddit, I prefer to invest in things that I read in Financial Times. Um, not that there is no gems or crap on, on either, but um, that's it's a market that it's way, way too, too dangerous and it's definitely not a place. I would say that the, the thumb rule that if someone wants to have crypto, no more than 5% of their, their entire portfolio. So a step back before we invest, my recommendation will have uh, will be to have three months of um, uh, three months spending worth in saving. And when I say saving, I mean saving, like saved either in your checking or or saving account, not in the stock market. Why not? Because typically when you need these savings, uh, it's where the stock market is crashed. The economy is now on the ground and uh, you lost your job and now you you go to pull your three salaries from three months saving and it's like the stock market took a bite on it um so keep it aside start with one have them two have three make it a goal it also helps to have those goals like it helps to like exactly you know what i'm saving towards and um and i would actually recommend even six months eventually right but you can start to invest, I think, after when you have three. I think it's comfortable enough. It also depends on your personal situation. Do you have family? Do you have any big expenses coming um, in the next few months, et cetera? Uh, typically, I would also, like people who want to become digital nomads and start to work remote, travel the world, I would recommend six months of savings as well before hitting the world. But it, again, it's, it can be very personal. It can vary from one person to another. 
if you live off $20,000 a month, uh, well, you definitely need savings. If you live off $500 a month, it's it will be fairly easy to generate this in the future if you need. You know, you can go work as a waiter in a restaurant bartending or be a clown in parties and you will make five hundred dollars a month. So uh, yeah. And also way. like if you're um you know if you're living in Israel and Ireland in the US, your three months expenses, if you move into a nomad lifestyle, that's gonna easily stretch to six months. Right. How much you spend in Sofia in Bulgaria? Yeah, much less than Ireland. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like uh, it, we we were both in in Bansko and re- a monthly rent is two hundred euros in in a normal apartment. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, Sixteen hundred, so you know, fifteen hundred in Ireland, like fifteen hundred euros a month, roughly yeah, for a yeah. single bed. Yeah, and it's a beautiful town, amazing people, good food. Um, so yeah, but, but okay, we'll talk a little bit more about my personal journey, but uh, back to the investment. Uh, I am big on stock. I think it's the most kind of classic vehicle when it comes to returns and don't try to outperform the market. Don't try to trade the market. Um, the recommendation typically is to buy uh, different indexes. You know, you do uh, some European indexes, you do some uh, S&P, NASDAQ, Dow Jones, US. This is the largest economy. Uh, they're still the, the leader of the, the free world when it comes to, to economy. So um, this is what most people do. I have a lot of money in like most majority of my stock portfolio in um, in index funds. And you can either directly in the index or index funds like Vanguard, very popular. They have very um, low management fees and it's very accessible, right? just buy and sit and you would deposit mo- every month more money into it just make it a habit um and let it grow it's not something you need to look and sit every day and check wait did it change oh my god it went down half percent like no let it sit there and open this in 20 years or five years and um very likely to to see the result again based on historical um information and data that we have real estate the problem with real estate, the, the entry ticket is much higher. You know, you, you will need, in most cases around the world, at least 20, 30,000 euros, uh, yeah, dollars to, to buy an asset. The advantage is you can leverage, right? So you can take $30,000 and you can buy a $100,000 property and have someone else, if you rent it out, pay your mortgage. Uh, that's a great asset class. Uh, I don't know. I know some wealthy people, a lot of them has um, real estate and I don't know anyone who has real estate and has failed uh, eventually. Like, yes, at some point your real estate might be worth a little bit less, but over time those assets generate money and seeing where the world population is, is moving towards, um, I like I would say that like in many, so many Places there are opportunities. Like I'm looking in Bansko, which is growing with the nomad community, Albania, which is um, growing also, and and the young generation there is becoming more and more open to the world and bring new wealth. Uh, you look at Tbilisi in uh, Georgia, Georgia, uh, also such a. So it, it's not. It doesn't have the, to be the traditional Atlanta property anymore, or San Francisco, New York, that any one of us can cannot buy anymore anyway. Uh, but you can go to places like Bansko and buy an apartment for 40,000 euros. Now, 40,000 euros are is big money, but it's not 400,000 euros. Yeah. Um, Have you, so uh, so, so yeah. sorry for jumping in, Dean, but you've, you're building your place in Bali. Do you have any other properties or any other real estate or is this kind of your first place? Yes. So I had an apartment before in Israel, uh, which was actually a very good uh it was a good deal. It's like lucky with the timing in the market. Uh, I I am invested in a couple buildings in the States. And when I say that I invested in buildings, don't think I have uh, an entire skyscraper in Manhattan. Um, it's more like I have the door handle of a building in San Francisco. Like I have a very small bite with what I could go in. And this is the beauty of being uh, participating in different funds. Um, that buy to a building in San Francisco for a few millions. And okay, I could put uh, $10,000 into it. I put $10,000 into it. 
and that allow me to enjoy uh, the profit that this asset uh, generates. Uh, it allows me to funds allow you to participate in deals that otherwise you would never be able to to be part of, right? And um, there's also something called REIT, R E I T. It's real estate investment trust. And some countries might have, they have a little bit of a different name and acronym to it, but it's technically a, a, an organization that invests in properties and obligated by law to distribute all the most of the profits on, on a schedule, right? So it kind of generates dividends. So it will not be the 20% return that we've seen on NASDAQ S&P in the last uh, six, seven years, but it can generate, I've been on funds that created actually 18% in a year, 9%, 11%, 7% a year. These are, these are very, very nice numbers. Why are these very nice numbers? Because if we go back to the discussion, when I mentioned that you need 4% on, on $900,000 a year to make $3,000 a month, what if your money makes 10% a year? Then you no longer need 900,000. Then your journey is shrank to $500,000, even less, $360,000 on 10% a year will generate the money you need. Mm -hmm. So that's also one of the things I did. I took uh, more risk. I'm young. If I need to, if something happens to my money, I lose everything. I'm still energetic, young, healthy. Uh, I can go and work and I can recover and I can do things and I have the energy to do it. So this is why don't be afraid to take a little bit more risk when you're younger. This is the, the better time to always do your due diligence, please. A very proper due diligence. But I took some uh, uh, riskier deals that worked out. Also, don't be, uh, on one hand, don't overreact and be overexcited about opportunities when they promise, not promise, but if they promise you a certain return, run away. Mm -hmm. right if they predict a certain return that's fine uh we just saw what happened to celsius this crypto company that promised people like 18 percent returns and just collapsed and filed for bankruptcy this doesn't work um over time and i've been in investment that the returns on paper should have been 80 80 percent a year and ended up being 11 but it's all still nice right um it, this was actually a real estate deal but I wanted to say the opposite. In our world, when we see returns of five, six, seven, eight percent, we often think this is amazing. And it's not bad. But it's also, we are also meant to believe that we need to retire at 67 or 70 or 65. And it's the same. The world has trained us to believe that 5% return is good. But as the closer you get to the assets, the more money you make, right? So if you invest in a real estate, uh, Trust, for example, you will make 6% a year. If you are the manager of the, the trust, you will make 8%. If you are the manager of the building, you'll make 10. If you are the developer of the building, you'll make 20. If you are the owner of the land, you'll make 15. The closer we get to the asset, the returns are crazy. I built myself a network of investors and people that this is one of their passions. And all of a sudden, I found myself getting access to deals that I could never participate in before because I just, I didn't know, I didn't play in this playground. And, and then I got access to investment that like make 20%. I invested, it's a small boutique investment firm called Art of FX, trade, foreign exchange. I would never hear, them, hear about them. I actually paying membership to an online community of investors. And that's where I learned about it. I've been investing with them for six years now, and they've been uh, yielding 20% every year, very, very stable for six years, including in downturns. Like this year, they uh, made 11% uh, profit from the beginning of the year, despite everything that we wow. saw on the, and yeah. on the stock market. So opportunities exist, and the, the, it's there. You just need to do a lot of homework. And uh, a, a saying that I really love is your network is your net worth. That's right? a term, so, yeah. Surround yourself with the right people, with the right mindset. If you, if I hang out with people that all I want to do is go shopping, 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 so I'll, I'll end up go shopping with them. 
you know, or if my friends just uh, sit at home and smoke weed and this is who I hang out with. So I'll eventually just sit home and smoke weed with them and have fun with them. I, neither way is bad, by the way. I don't, I'm not against anything, but it depends what you want for yourself. So I started to hang out with investors. I would go on meetup.com or I would join co-working spaces and, and make, like I do here and I go online and I put it to the world that this is what I'm passionate about. I'm attracting those people to my life. And um, yeah, just, just do the same. Go to this. If you love data science, go to a data science meetup. If you like public speaking, go to a, a Toastmaster event and, and surround yourself with these people to, to learn from. You know, we talked about investing money and getting knowledge. This is a hack which is almost for free. And the mm -hmm. same with podcasts. So much content out there for free. Like I like to say that I'm speaking to, to Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and like all the, the big names in the world all the time. I just, I talk with them on the phone I just don't speak. I'm on mute. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm You're listening in the room. to Bill Gates. He's like talking, talking, talking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Hang up. When, when I'm done with the conversation, I don't even need to say bye. I don't need to be polite. And, and this is a podcast. Like literally, I just spent time, like an hour, one hour with Tim Ferriss, with the same mm. room, with, with Tony Robbins, with Jay Shetty, with Gary V. It's like crazy, yeah. right? So, and... They often answer the I go to these people and answer the questions I ask about business, about investments, about entrepreneurship. Um, this is how I look at it. Like invest in a waterproof speaker. So this uh, five minutes of shower, you can also listen to uh, <laughs> to, to podcast. Yeah, mate. I, I love the Jim Rohn quote. You are the average of the five people you spend most time with. And if you are, I guess, in a position where your, you know, your community network physically is not really what you want it to be you can adjust that online like like you were saying so like if your friends aren't really giving you what you want maybe from a fitness or financial or you know mindset side of things you can put on people like tim ferris tony robbins all these people and kind of just be in the room with them essentially so it's a really good point throughout the, our conversation today we brought up this cliche of you are the, the average of your five closest friends, your network is your network. Uh, we talked about minimalism, the quotes from, from Fight Club. And sometimes even myself, when I listen to this, I say, okay, like stop with all those buzzwords and the cliches and all those sentences and the inspiration quotes. You know what's annoying? It actually works. <laughs> you, you are the average of your five friends and your network is your network. And it's as, as annoying it is sometimes to listen to it this way. It's it fucking works. And I'm sorry that I'm swearing on your podcast. But no problem. <laughs> it, it proves itself <laughs> over and over again in my life. It's just amazing. Uh, when I dropped all this resistance that I had to all these ideas, that's when the change happened in in um, in my life. So yeah, don't 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 be afraid to to follow these sayings and and try it for for yourself. And I'm sure yeah. that it's an easy exercise. Just look around the five people you hang out the most with and, and see where you're at in terms of relationship, health, um, uh, job, income. Now, I recently learned um, uh, nature versus nurture. And it's just a little bit of uh, moving aside from our main topic that we always thought that we have the same illnesses of our parents because of genes. Oh yeah, I'm the, the the son of my father, so of course I will have high cholesterol and uh, low blood pressure. No, it has nothing to do with genes. The reason I have the same thing as my father is because I eat the same thing as he does, because I saw how he, uh, uh, whether he train or not, he eat French fries or not, and I do the same. Mm. And this is why, and 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 why we learn this now because now we see a big movement of people going vegan and vegetarian changing from the diet of their parents and all of a sudden we see they don't have the same the same problem the same issue and that's amazing it's it's basically changing science like everything we thought about why we have certain things so it's, yeah. it's the same i love that mate way. i'm a huge uh, one thing i talk to my clients a lot about is is the power of environment which is basically yeah like that n nurture uh emphasis so just basically how your behaviors kind of shape you. Of course, you know, we're all predisposed to certain things based on our genetics, but you can, uh, you know, epigenetics, you can turn things on and off based on 
like what you eat, like you said, you know, if you eat exactly like your parents did, you know, communicate like they did, move like they did, you're probably going to turn out like them. But you can also change the, the route that you're on by making different decisions day to day. I think it's very empowering as well. Instead of just being like, oh, this is just the way I am. When I'm 50, I'm going to get a heart attack because that's what my father got. Um, you can change it, the trajectory of, of your path in your life as well. And like you were saying with the, you know, the finances with, the, with your family and the, the, the arguments, the fights, it's like you were like, this is where I'm going to go if I don't actually change the path as well. Exactly that. Yeah, exactly that. And I decided to make a change. And that I'm thankful for this experience with my parents. You know, that mm-hmm. they the best lesson they gave me is how not to manage my finance, my financial. That's how they, they, they taught me. And and, and they're, they're fine. And it's just not my way. And they, they made mistakes along the way. And that serves me as a, a lot of the time how not to do things. And that's it's just as a worthy lesson than as how to do things. Yeah, that's a really good point as well. Like if you don't have good role models or, or whatever, you can use them as like uh, advice of, of what not to do. So I want to talk to you as well because you, uh, how are you for time? Are you okay to chat for a bit more? I have two more hours until my oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can make it the uh, longest uh, podcast episode. <laughs> Joe Rogan episode. So, you know, it's been nine years, mate. And I guess something I've talked to a lot of people about, in particular in band school, because I, you know, I've, I've been basically uh, remote working for two and a half years. But like I spoke to a lot of people kind of like yourself who, you know, five, six, seven, nine, nine years was probably the longest. Um, but it's a long time to be moving around. And one thing I'm, I guess, trying to understand more is stability and kind of having that home base and community but also enjoying like the nomadic lifestyle. Um, so like, how can you give advice to me and other people? Like, how do you have that sense of stability, even though you're moving? I think you said 50 flights a year, something crazy. Like you've been to over 100 countries. So how do you maintain that stability routine, even though you're living this kind of lifestyle? I don't manage routine and there is no stability um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's hectic and it's crazy and that's the way i like it i gotcha. yeah i've been I, I was averaging 50 flights a year and 25 to 30 countries every year for five years now i still take i think probably 20 to 30 and i visit about 10 to 15 countries a year i travel a lot to visit friends now as well um but i love it i enjoy it, it gives me energy i enjoy airports i enjoy flying i enjoy the lounge i enjoy the, the whole experience um you know I, I i miss my friends so i want to go and see them and that's the freedom that i have if i miss someone in bulgaria i can just hop on a plane and go back and spend time with them and and that's the freedom but the biggest advantage the way i see it for being a digital nomad and have this location independence mode is not my ability to move from place to place and fly whenever i want it's actually my ability to stay in one place one place is going to coming here to Bali and I came here for a week then I said okay you know what it's nice I'll stay for two weeks and three weeks and then I ended up staying here for two years and now I'm building my house so that's the beauty it's like I can go anywhere I went to Medellin Colombia fell in love with the city eventually I eventually also met in love with a girl it's like okay I love it here and I stayed there for eight months and then when it wasn't good and I was like okay I can move somewhere else but the beauty of this lifestyle, I can get off this train at any point and say, hey, this is my new home. Visas are challenged in some places and it's not, everything is not super, super, super easy, but it's also not complex. Um, that's, we can also tie it later on to what I'm focusing on today is because you and I, uh, we are very privileged compared for the rest, rest of the world. We are very lucky with what we have in terms of passport and wealth and even our skin color and everything and for others life can look very very different and that saddened me a lot and that's something i'm out to change so i don't want to i don't want to go too deep there now but i'll say um i've changed a lot in the past year as a result of working as a result of a burnout that i had a severe burnout with all the side effects of uh, bad mood and depression and crying and and being in bed and not wanting to do anything, which is really not the, the person I am because I'm very uh, extrovert and out and about and a lot of energy. But then I took, um, I found a life coach that I really resonated with, the energy 
I took a personal trainer. I spoke with person with a relationship coach. It helped me not relationship just me and uh, the the other uh, gender with females, but also with my friends, but male friends. How I show up for them, and that completely changed me. And I moved from operating on quantity to quality, right? So I was like as many countries as I can every year, talk to as many people as I can, make a bigger, in, biggest impact than possible, uh, possible off. And now it's more like, you know what, let me find this like small circle of friends, which my life coach still make fun of me when I told him that my small circle of friends is 100 people. Um, <laughs> I do love <laughs> people a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I travel less. I'm, I'm hitting roots in one, two places. Um, I go deeper and deeper with certain friends, spend, spend more time with them have a deeper conversation. I dare to ask the questions. I dare to show up differently. And that helps me a lot because yes, after nine years on the road, it was like a little bit of um, like, who am I? You know, what mm. have I, what have I built? Do I have the close friends that I need to have to support my journey and everything that I stand for? Am I really having fun? And I found out that after experiencing the craziest ha- phase of happiness in my life, I had a drop and I wasn't happy and I made a change and I made this shift. So uh, the journey looks different for every person. And, you know, digital nomad is also a very wide term. Uh, it's like there are digital nomads which are very spiritual and they like certain things. And there are digital nomads that are non spiritual and just about kite surfing and mountain climbing. I don't know. It, 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 it's just a certain lifestyle. It's not, it doesn't say much about the person. Um, or you know about a digital nomad that he, he works remote. Um, you know, every person thinks differently. So yeah, I think you can. There's so many ways to to enjoy this level of freedom that is now accessible to to many of us. Mm-hmm. And uh, being in one place helped me to to have a routine. I did not have a routine. I would eat out all the time. I don't cook. I still don't cook, but um, I'm just more conscious to what I eat. I dropped. 12 kilograms within three months staying in the wow. same place working out every day and uh, where ordering. was that in bali that you dropped the 12 kilos that was in bali yes yeah, yeah. bali's such a it's such a fit place like it's just the lifestyle <laughs> there is you know everyone is is really into it so is that like your year now looking maybe when you decided to make that like more slow and, and i guess kind of address the issues that were starting to crop up with the with the burnout as well do you have now like your year you're kind of going to do you know three six months in bali and then i i see like you know you're in bansko are you going to south africa as well for nomad base <laughs> yes i will be in south africa for this um so my slow is most people's hyperspeed. <laughs> um, yeah I, so yeah i was just now in israel montenegro um where was it germany and again in, in bulgaria and now in bali next month i'll be in albania croatia bosnia um, oh, and possibly sicily um yeah i travel i, I travel lots uh, have you spent any time in romania actually that's where i'm going next i'm gonna spend uh, a bucharest. little bit uh, a bit of a time in bucharest and just some of the, the nearby cities uh it's a nice country but I never felt welcome there. It's um, it's not a very welcoming towards tourists. I mean, they're not gonna do anything bad to you. They're not just not as excited to see you as in different countries that really um, tourism is a big economy. But they have a beautiful countryside, a rich history, beautiful real estate, um, and, and landmarks throughout this, uh, Bucharest. Uh, so yes, um, good places. Again, I'm I, I I go to everywhere. I travel all over the world, and the experiences are often the people. Not not often, but mostly the people for me. It's not about let me climb another most uh, uh, tallest building in in some city, but it's more about meeting the locals. I don't travel the world so much. I actually live around the world. I go places. I can spend two months in Buenos Aires and not do a single tourist attraction. I can just sit in coffee shops and go meet people and go meetups and make friends. Um, you know, we can talk about this, like it, it, there is some loneliness and loneliness is actually the biggest pandemic that we deal with in the last uh, few years. Mm-hmm. And the, the digital moment lifestyle can be lonely and 
I, I travel solo, but I'm not, I don't travel alone, right? I uh, travel by myself, but I know people anywhere and everywhere I go now. Um, yeah, let's let's dive in so, there, mate, because definitely I think remote work, it's very glamorous, as you said, like a very, uh, just very lucky to be able to live this lifestyle. But then sometimes it definitely is like, you know, I've been basically traveling since 2013. There is, you know, bouts of loneliness. Um, and I guess what uh, advice do you have about traveling uh, maybe to more n nomadic communities or, or places where there's a bigger kind of hub of remote workers so it's easier to kind of slot in? Bansko definitely was, you know, the community there is fantastic. So do you have any kind of advice around that given you've done it for nine years? And I guess now you know low, you know people everywhere because of your lifestyle, but like advice for people who mightn't have the same network as you. Um, tap into people with ne network like mine, you know, reach out to me. <laughs> hey, Dean, do you know anyone in? They, even if you have um, 100 friends, on facebook or linkedin okay and you post hey do i know anyone in bucharest right so you have 100 friends and each of your friends has 100 friends if they share this or not don't even share this they just okay check with their 100 friends do i have someone in bucharest that's ten thousand people if each one of them check with their network that's a million. You can access million people with this. Most mm -hmm. people don't have hundreds of people on, on your Facebook. They have 500, all right? So we're talking 25 million people that you can access with a single post on LinkedIn um, and, and LinkedIn and Facebook and other social medias, Instagram, et cetera. Um, so tap into this. And my best, best, best advice would be don't be shy and don't be afraid to, no, 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 sorry, take it back. Be the first to say hi. Love that. You go on a, you, you go into a quarantine space, you sit next to someone, hey, introduce and say, hey, my name is Dean. Nice to meet you. That's it. It, it. it could feel awkward. And I was a person that wouldn't talk to anyone in a bar, and let alone ever like hit on a girl in a bar and start talking. I was like super afraid talking to everyone. Um, and I had the opposite experience. Someone, start talking to me and it's like, oh, like everyone wants to have some certain of connection when they travel solo. So you go on an airplane, you sit next to someone. Hey, uh, are you also traveling for vacation? You know, are you also traveling solo? And I just had a 10 hours flight from Doha to, uh, to Bali. I sat next to a girl from Saudi Arabia. I just introduced myself the second she sat next to me. I had one of the best flights in the world. Amazing conversation throughout the flight. Super nice. Other than if like you don't say hi in the first 10 seconds, it become awkward after like three hours. So like, hi, um, like it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, 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 we create this awkwardness. And because if you don't say and they don't say anything, it just stay in the situation for hours and hours until, okay. And how many times we sit next to someone and didn't open our mouth? You know, totally, how many times man. we sit in the talk and the, the speaker asks, anyone has a question, and look around, who's going to ask first? And, you know, and we because we're afraid to you no, know, just ask. Right? We all humans, we all mm. people, we have the same thoughts. Everybody has the same thoughts, but not everyone mm. is brave enough to say them out, out loud. Um, and you know, we all want to start a conversation. And what I do, one thing to emphasize here, the word also. When I say, do you also travel solo? I give out information before I ask for information. I gave them my answer already. And that's like, oh, Dean shared with me something about himself. It makes me comfortable to, to talk about, to give my answer. And it's about almost any, any topic. You know, two, two people talking about the salary, there's always this expectation that one will go first. Right? So it's the same, like go first, give some information out with your question, the way you phrase it. And I have a set of questions, like, are you also traveling solo? And that I, I reuse over and over and over and over. And some of my best friends for life um, started as one of those pickup lines for friendships. It's pickup line for pickup line for friendships. That's what it is. You know? Love that, <laughs> so, man. Yeah, it's all uh, like, 
it's that fear of rejection or fear of failure because we're both like oh i i, I kind of it's not that like i need to talk to this person but like it's going to be as you said 10 hours and it could turn into a great conversation but what if i'm if i you know if the person rejects me so you stop and then also just being a bit more open like i think vulnerability is a real superpower but it's really scary because like if you want to connect with someone on a deep level if you're more vulnerable with them, you'll connect. They'll feel like they get to know you better. They'll open up then because they'll feel safe. But it's like you said, it's being first initiating it because generally Next everyone time. waits. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're Every, really good points. All the people in your life, all your best, best, best friends today, including your parents, were strangers before. Your best friend was a stranger. You, know, like you just started to talk to him at some point. So... It's the same. Your next best friend might be sitting next to you right now as you listen to this podcast. <laughs> so true. I love it. <laughs> yes. You're on a plane <laughs> listening. <laughs> Say hi. And I have friends. I have two very good friends. One I met randomly in a restaurant and one on an airplane. Friends that we stay friends. Just you know, And you never know. You never know who you meet. And often, most times I meet five hours flight. We talk and that's it. Never see them again in my life. Don't bother to change information. It's good and it's okay. You know, have a set of questions because it can feel awkward. Are you also traveling solo? Is Doha your final destination? Uh, uh, some question that's relevant. You know, um, are you going to travel the destination? Uh, something like that. Share information. Like, you know, don't be afraid of long answer. Like, oh, you, I'm I'm late. I have a layover in Doha for six hours. Oh, I'm I'm going to travel Qatar for for three days. I have some plans to go see this and this. I was like, oh yeah, I've been there. Super nice. You get information. If you end up sitting next to a local person who who lives in the country city you're going to, he will give you the best advice and the nicest place to go visit. If it's a, another traveler, they just might hang out with you for the rest of the trip or the rest of your life. You never know. Yeah, very true, mate. The, Let's jump into small... sorry one. I just said like that it's 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 a split of a second when you say hi to someone and it can change your entire life. Think about Tinder, right? When you swipe right and left in Tinder, it takes you a split of a second. But this split of a second, for some people I know, change their entire life trajectory. They are now married and have families with the people they swipe. Like they did this, they swipe, boom, the entire universe has changed. Like a, a whole bing bang was created as a result of this. So really you don't know what can happen from those small connections or when you say yes to an online course, to a life coach, to change a habit, to start saving money. Like you're creating a whole new universe. Love it, mate. Let's jump into some uh, more rapid fire questions. So let's uh, like something you've changed your mind on recently, maybe in the last three to six months that you maybe taught a certain way and now you think differently about the topic. So one is the invest in yourself and the second will be uh, trusting others more than I trust myself, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. It will not be a rapid. As I said, I have long answers to short questions. <laughs> I paid close to $1,000 to a personal trainer here in Bali, which is unheard of. Like salaries in Bali are like $200. And... And I told him, like, dude, I want to be, I want to hit my 40th birthday at the best shape that I've been in the 10, in the last 10 years. I want to have a six pack. And he says, yeah, no problem. 12 weeks. Meet me tomorrow at, at the garden on your, of your house. That's what he tells me. And I tell him, dude, what garden? I want to have six pack. I want to lift. I want to like cardio. I want to like, and he said, no, you're not going to lift a single weight, right? It's like, you're not doing this. Meet me tomorrow, 6 a.m. We, we train every morning, 6 a.m. And I said to myself, you know what, Dean? You paid him because he's professional. He, he has a six pack. He look amazing. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to follow his system. And I did. And it happened. And I was like, how many other things in my life I missed on when I, I came with my ideas and my thoughts and the way things should be done and I missed on. So... I let all those safeguards and like not trusting others down. I work with a life coach. 
I cry on every session with him because I took these guards off. And when he tell me to scream into a, uh, a pillow and punch it to deal with my anger, anger management, I do it and it works. So that's one thing I learned that, okay, let me try different things. Because at age 40, I have so many ideas about the world that the way I see it, but it, there are so many other ways to do things. So it's that. And also like delegating and, and trusting others. I delegate tasks. And I'm not going to micromanage. I pay you to do this. I ask you to do something. You do it. It's yours. And I, whatever the outcome will be, um, it, it's, it's, it's perfect. It's, it's beautiful. Mm. Do you have a, a team of people that help you or do you kind of outsource individual roles or are you one man show? I'm in, I'm building it right now. So I'm the founder of Digital Nomad Israel. It's an online community for nomads with uh, over 35,000 people. And until not long ago, I was running it myself. And it was insane. Mm, but it was wow. because I was afraid to let go control and no one else can manage this better than me, right? Uh, and I was broke. So I just had my fourth team member join me yesterday. Mm. And um, from everything else, I'm looking for someone to help me with the social media. I had a conversation with someone today. I'm helping, waiting, looking for someone to help me with my website um, and many, many other things. I have a life coach, again, personal trainer. Um, I, I start to outsource because my brain, I hit a limit. I cannot, I barely sleep anyway. I push myself to my limits. I either need to change the, 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 the way I think or just expand and expanding is by getting smart people, the people I trust around me. Yeah, yeah, okay. Next, uh, if you were to have a, go for dinner with someone that you, you know, inspires you, who would be your ideal dinner date and why? Hmm. Right now, I would love to speak to Bill Gates, actually. Bill and Melinda Gates and what all the philanthropy they do. Um, I, yeah, uh, I would love to to learn from you how to to make a bigger impact uh, in in the world and how you use wealth for for the good of of others. Mm. That that would be nice. Uh, also, my nephews, super okay. nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they can come with me to meet Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> Next, what are you most grateful for, and why? Uh, well, that's another change from the recent year, uh, working for a coach. I'm full of gratitude and I share it more often. Um, I created very good life for myself and I appreciate the level of freedom. So I'm, I'm full of gratitude for the freedom and the people that I have in my life. And I would say even more the people because the freedom I have is the result of the people I know. I learned mm. something about this life from every person I came, um, came across, uh, whether it was a brief meeting or someone I know for 10 years now. So I'm, I'm, I have an amazing, amazing network of, of people in my life. Um, yeah, re really thankful for, yeah. 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 I, and just even now taking the moment to think about it and it's like kind of filled with like a little bit of tears and like, wow, I'm very, very fortunate to, to have, this amazing people in my life. Yeah. Next, if you were to have any special ability, if you could wake up tomorrow with that ability, what would it be and why? <laughs> um, flying, obviously, going to save me a bunch of money on travel and uh, less, less uh, pollution. Uh, so it will be, it will be that. Well, yeah, also see the, things from different angle, uh, different perspective. It's true in, in like with our sight, with our vision, but it's also true with our mind and brain to see things from different um, uh, point of views. So it will be, it will be that. The, have you had people uh, saying teleportation? Yeah, teleportation and flight are the two most common answers. <laughs> yes, okay. So I'll just say, because. Yeah. I, I don't say teleportation because I think if someone saying teleportation, they're being lazy or spoiled, more, more, more spoiled because we already have teleporters. I use them every week. They call airplanes. And yes, it doesn't happen instantly, 
but it teleports you from one place on earth to another within like four hours. Mm-hmm. And you have Wi-Fi and food and drinks throughout the journey, which I'm pretty sure other teleporters in the future will not have. So this is like, yeah, we have teleporters and we should stop <laughs> trying to, to invent, like build a different technology. It's pretty good. Um, and if, when you, a lot of the things I do in my life to achieve what I do is to twist things and think about them this way. Uh, talk about the, the teleportation, right? Yeah, I have it. Like I can teleport anywhere. It's just how we look at this. Yeah, perception. 100% made. What's your greatest accomplishment and why? The people I have around me. Uh, but it's definitely Digital Nomads Israel. Um, I started this community just with like two mouse clicks on Facebook, trying to connect with few people that possibly be been working would be working remote in Israel. And it grew to be 35,000 people, super engaged. Anywhere I go in the world now, I meet people from my community. Uh, it helped to change the lives of thousands of people and, and families and help them to have to live the life they want and, and have a certain level of freedom that before didn't exist. So having the platform and being able to to make an impact on so many people on so many lives that I think amazing. And I yeah, very that's 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 my legacy in a way. Um and I'm now growing this to be international and I want to make the same same impact. Uh, on a much, much, much larger scale. Very exciting. So are you going to keep the branding as Digital Nomads Israel or are you going to just move it to Digital Nomads kind of worldwide? Or uh, Digital Nomad Israel is, is, it's all in Hebrew content. It's very focused on the Israeli community and it will be by its own. I am working on something that I don't think I've shared anywhere yet. Um, it's called United Nomads. It's the new UN organization. Um, an alternative UN organization that its goals are not even set, but the vision is to really um, get everyone together under the same set of values of helping others and respecting uh, others and strangers, respecting them physically and, and mentally and their ideas and the culture. Um, I'm a, I, the, a project that I'm also wanting to launch, and maybe this is uh, me putting this out to the world here. One of the listeners is interested in that. Uh, I've been paying for a domain for about 10 years now, which is called iloveyourrace.com. And I want to fight racism because I travel the world and I see so much beauty and so much good, but I also see a lot of hate for ridiculous reasons. And and I want to change it. And instead of my idea is instead of us trying to wash our differences and equalize everyone, you know, there's a lot of politically correctness now. And like, don't call someone gay and don't say he's Asian and don't call her a transgender. Like we try to come with different terms that we kind of feel that we are all normal or not normal. I'm 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 saying the different the, the, the different thing. You're Muslim, this is beautiful. Let's celebrate this. Show me your traditions. Let's celebrate your music. You're Indian, let's celebrate the food, the colors, what you stand for. Anything, you know, you're black, you're yellow, you're white, whatever we are, like, and celebrate all these differences and uniqueness that we, we have in, in us. And I would love to start this, this movement um, and create this understanding and feeling between people that we are all the same species and equal and there's no it, it's so stupid to hate someone because their religion or because of their skin color like it's not something that in our control in in most cases yes um, and those ideas ideas are also been put on us by history books oftentimes and education right like uh, our generation is fighting wars very often time or hating people bec- not because we they did anything to us but because 
eight years ago or 200 years ago, someone fought with them. And, and from now on, oh, we like, you know, they did this to us. So we need to hate them. You know, Korean mm. and Japanese, South North Korea, which actually still happens. Okay. But uh, you see this, um, see it in Israel and Palestine. And that's where I'm from. Mm. I'm coming from this region. And I felt like, I don't care how you call this place. Can I just have a beer and enjoy a night out? And I, you know, people will say uh, occupying country. Like I don't occupy anything. I didn't take anything from anyone. It's just like I've been busy at work. You know, <laughs> it's like so. I don't hate anyone. No one actually also hate me, and that's the, the beautiful thing. Because when I meet Palestinians, and I do it, they have nothing against me. They know I've done nothing. Like mm. so. This is something that I want to like change, and that's why I love flying because you fly. 30,000 feet above earth and you don't see borders. You don't see, oh, this is Syria and this is Lebanon and this, no, like it, it, you can't tell. It's just the same mountain. It's the same desert, the same ocean. So it's those, uh, yeah, all these uh, ideas that we put or uh, enforced, enforced on ourselves and our children over time. Sorry. I no, that's <laughs> awesome, mate. It's so, I think that's the real one of the many benefits of travel is you kind of realize because like in Ireland obviously there's a huge history with Ireland and England and I remember growing up to be a lot of anti-English sentiment in Ireland you just kind of were told not to like English people and then I went traveling and I was like I mean English people are there's great English people there's like people in England who are, who are idiots as well but there's people in Ireland who are idiots you know so there's like lovely yeah. people everywhere it doesn't matter what you speak what you look like what your beliefs are and I think that's what travel teaches you is like um you know the borders or, or colors or, or or whatever it doesn't really make a difference it's just about the person as an individual yeah and when you think about it it's actually we, we are kind of creating this separation from the people that are actually most likely to be close and like us because there are some um, similarities between Irish people and British people. I mean, same mm. region. Yeah, also totally. Also in Israel. I mean, you can mistake me to be Lebanese, Iranian, Syrian, and, and Middle Eastern. That's what I am. Right? That's where I'm from, right? So, so those people that I should actually get along the most because we both like hummus and we speak very different <laughs> yeah. languages and we have yeah, the yeah. same traditions, I end up being taught that I should, I'm, I'm in war with. Mm. I am not in war with anyone. Me as Dean Kuchel, I've never been in war with anyone, you understand? And that's, if, if we start to look at about uh, on the world on this way, you know, like we, we are not in war with anyone. I traveled the world. I turned off the news when I started to travel. And I've been living in world peace since. I'm here. No one killed me. Maybe I'm lucky. Maybe I'm not. Uh, but I started to travel to Mexico. <gasps> Dean, go, don't, don't go to Mexico. They will murder you. I went to Peru. Dean, don't go to Peru. They'll kidnap you. Dean, go, don't, don't go. If I would listen to the news... I would probably stay home until now in, in a closed room, picking through a small crack, saying the world is safe. Mm. All the news is, what is the news? It's, it's a drama show. Let me get you all the bad news that happened today in town, all the traffic, all the accidents, all the murders, all the burglaries, and feed it to you. Either your newspaper or TV. Here, here's, a, here is a glass of poison for you to start the day. All the bad mm. shit that happened overnight, you know? Wait, you go to sleep? Just watch the news one last time. I'll give you a little bit of poison before that. And, and this is what it is. And if they cannot... Where, where are you from in Ireland? Uh, County Clare. So southwest of Ireland. So I say, and if they cannot find news from there, Ireland was peaceful today. Um, you know what? Maybe there is an accident uh, in Milwaukee that we should report. Maybe there is a fire in Brazil that we should let you know about. Maybe there was a a gunfire in New Zealand, like, I care for this, but why do I really care for this? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, we will make sure, so I turn off the news, like, you want to take one advice for me, don't do it, take three, minimalism, say yes, and turn off the news. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs>
Last question, mate. Uh, if you could write something on a billboard, which you know millions, if not billions, of people will be able to see, what would it be and why? It's a tough one. It's an easy one and a tough one. Uh, it would be say yes and go explore. Uh, that's been my mantra and kind of my uh, to go saying I say yes to anything and everything in life. Um, it brought so many amazing opportunities and experiences and I never regretted saying yes. I always only regretted saying no. And it you know, yes to hike a volcano, yes to go to a party, yes to try mushrooms, yes to jump off an airplane with a parachute, yes to salsa dance, yes to everything. And yes, let's go to Bali and yes, let's go to a meetup. Oftentimes I go to like, you, you asked me about how to make connection. You go to a city and you like travel all day and then at night there is a meetup at 9 p.m. It's like, oh, I just go home, I want to rest. I don't feel like going out. I would always like be in bed and like after two minutes, Dean, what are you doing? Say yes and go to this event. And every time I came back from an event like this, 2 a.m., I, all I could think about on the way home was like, oh my God, thank God that I said yes and went to this event. What amazing people I went to, I met. What amazing event. What I, I'm, Just that opened me. That's what created the universe that I have around me right now. So say yes don't be afraid to try things really like um when, when we say yes we move to opportunity to our court it doesn't mean that i execute on everything that i say yes but if i get a phone call on a friday afternoon dean do you want this job and i say no on a monday when i change my mind and i call and say no sorry you said no we know that if we already gave the opportunity to someone else but when i say yes on a friday i sleep on it throughout the weekend on monday i can still say no if i want Mm. I have the opportunity. Now I own the opportunity. Do you want to jump off an airplane? Yes. Put the parachute, go on an airplane, fly 9,000 feet. You don't have to jump yet. But when you'll be there, you'll most likely jump because you'll say yes again. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and go explore because we have beautiful world and there is so many, not, not so many, like most people on this planet are good. Like it's, 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 it's Tiny, tiny, tiny um, portion of people that actually here to do harm, and there's so much to see, and there's so much to 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 taste and feel and, and experience, and, and yes, like enjoy, live your best life, and I I think that say yes and go explore is um, really served me well. Now, if I have a second billboard, or if I can do like hashtag below this it would be i love your race because it this is really a mission that i would love to to push for worldwide awesome bro dude that was epic um really enjoyed chatting to you i'm glad that we we only talked for about two or three minutes in band school so we, we we met up for today so where can people learn more about you what you do if they want to kind of explore more about your your content your mission all this stuff where can we send them so dim kuchel um, or yeah, you can look me up uh, online. Google's dinkuchel.com is my website. Uh, dinkuchel on Instagram, dinkuchel on Facebook. Connect with me to LinkedIn if you want to expand your professional network. Connect with me on Instagram if you want to uh, to follow my travels and uh, meet up somewhere around the world. And um, yeah, I think that's it. I mean, you can look up if you like podcasts. You can look up my name on Spotify. I have some other interviews they gave, different topics, uh, just expanding on different ideas that I spoke here today briefly. Um, but yeah, they reach out to me. I'm happy to talk, happy to make friends, happy to help. Um, I'm the easiest person to, to find until very not long ago, like a couple of weeks ago, my uh, brand name, like my online nickname was Where is Dean? um and you can literally google where is dinner it will tell you where i'm at but now i'm changing it like i'm, I'm following the dean kuchel um just to streamline the brand um mm -hmm. but yeah I, i'm the easiest person to find really. <laughs> awesome mate. well look i appreciate your uh spending time and sharing more about your story and yeah i think it'd be cool to do a round two at some point as well to see where you are and what you're doing in, in the future okay Happy to catch up for another two hours anytime. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs>